above the lands of Egypt, the sun god Ra and the falcon god Horus reign supreme. But on Earth, there is one man who the gods have elevated beyond all others, the Pharaoh. He is responsible for maintaining the divine force of Maat, the subtle balance between order and chaos. But one Pharaoh with a 67-year reign surpasses all others. His name has stood the test of time. Today, we call him Ramses the Great or Ramses the Second. But for his people, he was the king Usher Mat Re, meaning the justice of Ra is powerful. Ramesses' greatest achievement is in creating the most powerful myth that Egypt perhaps ever had. Across his kingdom, Ramses erected monuments celebrating his prowess as a warrior. He built a city bearing his name in which 300,000 of his subjects lived, aspiring to just one thing, serve their king. He was the architect of peace with long-standing enemies, the Hittites, and the most prolific royal father Egypt has ever known. Ramses really is over the top in every category. Ramses the Great forged his own legend and succeeded in eclipsing many of those who reigned before or after him. It's uh, quite moving to stare into the face of history. This is the story of Ramses the Great and his dynasty. Nothing suggested that the family who gave rise to the 19th dynasty of Egypt's new kingdom were destined to rule. The ancestors of Ramses the Great were not born of royal blood. They did not work at court or in the kingdom's most influential temples. Their ascent to the throne began under the reign of a pharaoh who had abandoned the many traditional gods of the kingdom, choosing to devote himself to a single god. By his choices, Akhenaten seemed to have drawn divine wrath upon Egypt, and his son, Tutankhamun, failed to perpetuate their lineage. Trouble and chaos descended on the Egyptian kingdom. It was considered to be a heretic time. These were heretical rulers who went against Ma'at, or the order of ancient Egypt, by their revolutionary religious change. It was almost as if the gods had turned their backs on Egypt. When Tutankhamun died, his old vizier Ai ascended the throne. But I only reigned for four years, and he didn't leave an heir who would take over. It was time for new leaders, strong, righteous, and devoted, to restore order to the heart of the kingdom. The first of these was Horam Heb, a man at the crossroads of history who will see out the end of one dynasty and trigger the start of the 19th dynasty, into which Ramses the Great will be born. In the time of Tutankhamun and his father before him, Horam Heb was commander-in-chief, then general of the armies and vizier. He was the one who whispered in the ear of the young, inexperienced sovereign. His natural authority is as strong as Tutankhamun's was weak. Horam Heb soon becomes essential to the running of the kingdom. This is the tomb of Horam Heb in Saqqara. Saqqara was the necropolis of the ancient capital of Memphis. And this tomb is grand. It's large with beautiful carvings. It almost feels like a temple. And it was built in the reign of Tutankhamun. The 
this tomb gives us a glimpse to the power and prestige that Horemheb had as the chief of the army and as the vizier before he even became the king. This image shows rows and rows and rows of Nubian captives. These are people that were brought back to Egypt from the wars Horemheb went on, on behalf of Tutankhamun to regain the territories in Nubia that were rebelling a bit after the reign of Akhenaten. So this shows the military might of Horemheb. We have these captives being brought in single file and Egyptian administrators with big sticks, pulling them, dragging them along. There's a bit of manhandling and pushing and some hitting going on too. And they're doing this because Nubia was the place of gold for Egypt and it was a major center of trade resources. So after the reign of Akhenaten, Tutankhamun really wanted to reassert control in Nubia. And this is something that Horemheb would have had to do as chief of the army. Another major interest for Tutankhamun and also Horemheb was regaining territories that were lost in Syria-Palestine under the reign of Akhenaten. And here we have a row of people from the Levant that were being also brought in as captives from campaigns and wars that Horemheb was fighting on behalf of Tutankhamun in Syria-Palestine. These guys are distinct because they have these long beards, they have the long hair, different hairstyles, and these are almost standard tropes of people from Syria, Palestine, and ancient Egyptian art. So this is a sort of classic Near Eastern people uh, to ancient Egyptians. They're bound. Their arms are, are inside ropes and they're being dragged and pulled by an Egyptian administrator or member of the army. And they're being pulled towards this image of Horemheb. This is a remarkable relief. It shows Horemheb receiving the highest honor he can. These are necklaces upon necklaces of solid gold. This is the gold of praise. And the king rewards his most dutiful subjects and his most impressive administrators with this gold of honor. This was a massive achievement for Horemheb, and as you can see, he's just drenched in this gold, just carrying all of it. And this shows that Tutankhamun was happy with the work he was doing, running the country and expanding the borders and taking control of the military. the royal palace. Horemheb has all the qualities needed to become a great king. And when the pharaoh Ai dies without an heir, Horemheb is the natural choice. He is the only one capable of straightening out a kingdom plagued by disorder. <laughs> When he ascends the throne, Egypt is emerging from five turbulent decades, and the people hope that their new pharaoh will herald a new era of law and order. For too long, greedy officials have profited from the turmoil caused by the political and religious choices of previous pharaohs. They have embezzled state resources and cheated the poor. These corrupt men have grown rich at the expense of the people of Egypt. Horemheb singles out higher-ranking officials and demands swift justice. With Horemheb, one gets the sense by reading the documents that he left us is that he was a very pragmatic military man, um, that he you know, set things out that he was going to do, and he got them done. So he was really quite the right man at the right place. In the great temple of Amun at Karnak, we're actually at the southernmost edge of it.
This is what we call a 10th pylon, which basically means a monumental gateway. And this was finished off, and most of the um, inscriptions on it were done by King Horemheb. Now, Horemheb is a really interesting character. Once he's fully in power, he issues a decree against corruption and all sorts of other bad things happening in the state. And that decree is set up on a stone stealer, which is against this pylon. The placement of this decree in the great temple here, it's aimed at the gods. It's here in their domain. So this area here is very much a place where Horemheb is asserting himself and justifying himself as king. This is the stela which has the decree of Horemheb. It's a long text and as you can see, a large chunk of it is now missing. However, there's enough of the text surviving to be able to get a fair amount of detail and certainly the overall gist of the whole thing. The idea of the decree is to try and put things right, to make sure the country is running as it should do and that corruption, crime and so on is cut back. The very fact that Horim Hare felt a need to issue this suggests that all these bad things were happening. Piracy, people seizing goods illegally, and all those kinds of things. What Horim Hebb wanted to do is proclaim himself as the pharaoh of right and order. He wanted to reestablish the order of Egypt that had just fallen into such disarray. And it was also a way of lifting up the office of kingship, which had fallen into such notoriety um, by the previous dynasty. And Horemheb issued a series of laws that this is not going to happen again, and this is the punishment if you do this. The kind of punishments we find here tend to be corporal punishment. So therefore there is a soldier who is caught. He is going to be beaten and then have open wound. Uh, there's also, you get people who have their noses and ears cut off and sent to work in the mines. This little group is quite interesting because if you don't read hieroglyphs, it's quite clear what sort of thing is going on because this is a violent punishment. And a little man here were holding a stick as part of the group of signs and that indicates it's an act of violence. So many of the punishments are all to do with inflicting pain and injury. <laughs> Nothing which is punished by the death penalty. In Egypt, it was more to do carrying on living, but with consequences. And what Horem Heb is trying to achieve here is a regime whereby taxes go where they're supposed to, graft is eliminated, so, so therefore it's an efficient regime, an efficient kingdom, with everybody doing what they're supposed to, rather than doing what they're not supposed to. After Horem Heb comes to power, he moves the capital city to Memphis. The new king surrounds himself with loyal and faithful allies and advisors. These are men with no blood ties to the previous dynasty, which is considered spiritually corrupt. 
One of his most loyal advisors is the man who will become the grandfather of the future Ramses the Great, Paramasu. Paramasu belongs to the elite of the Egyptian army, the cavalry. He was born in Avaris in the Nile Delta, an area on Egypt's eastern border where influences and peoples have always mixed. The chariot tree was introduced into Egypt from Syria, from Palestine, and it became a fundamental part of its whole military power. Haramisu was an army general. We know a certain amount about his family, and it seems to be fundamentally a military one. All the members of the family have military titles and so on. Paramasu's family do not come from the lower classes of society, but they are far from noble, and Paramasu is very ambitious. Hormheb and Paramasu had fought together in battles. They were obviously good friends and loyal to one another. Horemheb gave him a number of very, very important titles. For example, he was the overseer of a fortress at Sile. Sile was a really important fortress because it was between Egypt and the uh, trade network to the Eastern Mediterranean Basin. He also uh, gave him the title of uh, priest of the gods of Upper and Lower Egypt, which is mind boggling because what he did is he put the military and religious titles and administrative titles together. Horemheb eventually appoints Paramasu as vizier, the most prestigious position in the kingdom, second only to the pharaoh himself. With the support and advice of Paramasu, Horemheb works to restore harmony to the kingdom. But he must also ensure the continuity of his dynasty. For more than 20 years, the Egyptian throne bounced from crisis to crisis because the previous pharaohs, in particular Tutankhamun, had serious fertility problems. Horemheb is about to change all that. In the 13th year of Horemheb's reign, his great royal wife, Mutnojmet, becomes pregnant. She is the most beautiful woman at the court. She wears delicate clothes woven from the finest fabrics. For the people, she is a true goddess, beautiful, intelligent, and benevolent. And to top it all off, she carries in her womb the future and the stability of the kingdom. Horam Heb is in the middle of his reign, and he knows that he desperately needs an heir. He's potentially the third king in a row to have no heir to take over the throne. And he has hopes, he's praying for a healthy baby boy to continue his line. He knows that if he doesn't get an heir, his entire project, all the struggles that he went through to become king would be for nothing because he couldn't pass on the throne and create a new dynasty. Things do not turn out as Horemheb and his royal wife Mutnojmet have hoped. This is the burial shaft of Horemheb's tomb. He made this intending for his burial when he thought the peak of his career was vizier and chief of the army. 
but that's not what happened. He went on to become king, and instead this burial shaft was used for his wife, Nojmet. Here, excavators in 1975 discovered the mummy of a woman, and they found a bunch of inscriptions around, making it clear that this was Mut Nojmet. This was the wife of Hormheb. So when she died, she was buried right here in this shaft. Years later, archaeologists went back and they, they looked at her mummy and they found that there were these small bones of a fetus inside of her. And this shows that she was pregnant at the time of her death. And we don't know what happened, if this was a death in childbirth or if she, if she passed away in the later stages of her pregnancy. But either way, the, the hopes and dreams of Hormheb for an heir were gone. The child was the heir Hormheb had waited so long for. This was certainly a tragedy for him. And we think about the kings of Egypt being these all-powerful godlike figures, but they were still very human. And this must have been a devastating loss for him. And at this moment, he probably realized he would have to do something drastic because he doesn't have an heir. And if someone was going to continue kingship from him, he would have to look for some kind of alternative solution, someone else to take up the throne after he passed. The king is devastated by the death of his wife and child. His vizier, Paramasu, tries to console him, but there is little he can do. The palace is in mourning. Seti, Paramasu's son, is about 12 years old when Queen Mutnajmet dies. Despite his young age, he must be aware that this tragedy is not just a personal loss for Horemheb. It is a disaster for the entire kingdom. Another wife must provide a son at all costs. If Hormheb has no male heir, who will inherit the crown? Who will take over when the time comes? Fortunately for Horam Heb, his wish for a son will never materialize, and that will prove transformational for the family of the future Ramses the Great. Unable to father a viable heir with any of his wives, and with time working against him, Horam Heb is forced to make a drastic decision. I suspect that there were people in Egypt who were almost losing faith in the concept of kingship, because the concept of kingship is it's passed down from father to son since the time of the gods. And it's been blatantly the case for some decades that, that was not happening. So Horemheb had to appoint somebody as the heir to the throne. And the person he chose was then called Paramisu.
This is a lovely statue of a late 18th dynasty administrator. It has all of the hallmarks of an elite official of that time period. This man is sitting with a beautifully carved wig. He has this, this heavy, heavy wig. And I can see this is a very expensive statue because the artisans carved each and every piece of this wig to emphasize its texture. And on his arm and on his shoulder are the names of the king that he serves. So this says Horemheb. So this is an official under the king Horemheb. There's more text on the statue that lets us know who this late 18th dynasty official is. Down here, it says, Chati Pa Remesu. That means Vizier Pa Remesu. And he's a high official connected with the army. He's known for his fighting background. So he's connected to the two most important offices in Egypt. Horemheb is looking around of his high officials, Pa Ramesu looks like an ideal candidate to become the next king. Horemheb was looking for a man of stature, somebody who believed in the same things that he believed in, and so that is why he reached out to Paramesu, because he knew that he would be the logical um, continuer of his legacies. Horemheb and Pararamsu were pretty much the same in age. So the question is, why would he have picked Pararamsu as his successor? <laughs> Horemheb, last king of the 18th dynasty, taps Paramesu because he had an heir and a spare. So right there, the dynastic succession is taken care of. The heir is Seti, the son of the vizier Paramesu, a career soldier like his ancestors. He is also the very young father of a son with his wife, Tuya. This child, is the future Ramses the Great. His Egyptian name is Paramesu, meaning the god Ra gave birth to him, given in honor of his grandfather, Vizier Paramesu. Paramesu was not of royal blood. He was a military officer who served with Horemheb, um, and it was Horemheb that saw how beneficial it was with a military mindset to place a fellow uh, military officer as uh, his successor. One thing that seems probably clear is that Horemheb must have chosen Paramesu because he had a viable heir a son, Seti, who could then carry on the line. Because the one thing the pharaohs did not want at this time was to have it all in collapse. And that's where things were going at the end of the 18th dynasty. They had restored the traditional gods, they'd reopened the temples, they'd reopened these cults but there was a concern about the nature of kingship and the strength of the kingship. All Egyptian pharaohs make propaganda that they essentially were chosen by the god, they were set on the throne, and that they were put in place by their father. But Horemheb and Paramesu make themselves rulers of Egypt, pharaohs in name, but in fact with no particular aristocratic lineage that connects them deeply to the pharaohs of the past. So it's then important to really create a new feeling in the dynasty, to no longer just have the sense of some generals who are controlling Egypt as it's going out of control, but rather to bring it back around and put it on a right course.
Plains for some 20 years. He has done much to restore calm and prosperity to the kingdom. When he dies, the young Ramses the Great, son of Seti and grandson of Paramasu, is barely eight years old. Egypt now has a new ruling family with a mission to establish a lasting dynasty. The day after Horemheb's burial, the vizier Paramasu becomes the new pharaoh of Egypt. His family will leave an indelible mark on history. Paramasu, a commoner, the son of a simple soldier, has become the most powerful man on earth. And at his side stands his son, Seti. adopts a new royal name. From now on, he will be known as the Pharaoh Menpetire, meaning the power of Ra is lasting. But today, he is better known as Ramses I. A new royal line has begun in Egypt. Immediately, Ramses I gives his son Seti the title of Sanesu Semsu, eldest son of the king, designating him the royal prince and heir to the throne. The new king, like all pharaohs before him, has a divine duty to restore order and balance to Egypt. This is a stele of Ramses I, and it's one of the few images we actually have of him. He only reigned for two years, so he didn't have time to make as many monuments, to carve his image and his name all across Egypt. So this is pretty rare, and it's a, a special stele. Ramses I was pretty old when he came to the throne, but yet here he's shown as, as a youthful figure. And this is like all the pharaohs. They didn't want to show themselves as aging and the physical signs of getting older. So what they wanted to do was to make themselves forever young. What I like about this so much is that it tells us a great deal about who Ramses I was and where he came from. This is the image of the king and he's giving offerings to this god. God is named Seth, and he has a sort of unusual appearance. He's what we call the Seth animal. He's got this curved snout and long truncated ears. It's a mythological creature. He, to the ancient Egyptians, would have been sort of a chaotic figure, a god associated with things that we wouldn't think you would want to worship. The god Seth was the murderer of his brother Osiris. 
So he's part of chaos, he's part of destruction. He's also connected to the red land and the desert. And it might be weird that a pharaoh is giving him offerings, but he's doing that because chaos is part of the balance of life. It's what the ancient Egyptians were seeking, is this good and evil, this kind of equilibrium between them. So imagine what the world would be like if you only had good. You had to have something to balance it. Importantly, Seth was the god of this eastern delta town that Ramses was from. So Ramses I is here paying homage to his local deity. And this would set the tone for all the Ramesid kings afterwards. They were connected to Seth, and interestingly enough, with Syria and Palestine. It seems that the new royal family had a background which wasn't wholly Egyptian. During the 18th dynasty, a lot of skilled military people, particularly those associated with chariotry, came from Syria, from Palestine. And it may well be that Ramesses' roots lie actually in the area. If they did indeed have any kind of foreign background, Although that might at first sight seem not the right sort of background for having becoming a pharaoh of Egypt, by, the, by this period, Egypt is an amazingly cosmopolitan kind of place. And also the important point for Egyptians is not what your blood is, is, what, is how you see the world. And there are a lot of people during the 18th dynasty and 19th dynasty who clearly are not genetically Egyptian, shall we say, yet they are fully embraced by that because they do what an Egyptian does. When his grandfather ascended the throne, the young Ramses the Great's life changed overnight. Royal propaganda would later say that ever since he was in his mother's womb, a great destiny had been waiting for him. But now everyone in Egypt knows it too. When Paramesu becomes king, this gives the platform to Prince Ramses because now he's in the spotlight. There's King Ramses I, then uh, his father Seti, and then Ramses. So this is sort of the triumvirate of uh, rulers that Egypt will uh, experience probably for the next hundred years. Prince Ramses, grandson of the reigning pharaoh, begins his education at the court school, an institution known as the CAP. Young Ramsey went to the CAP, and this was a school that was connected to the palace. It's where the elite boys of Egypt went to study, as well as foreign princes and the sons of the king. Young school kids in Egypt, they would use something that we would consider like a notebook. They would take broken pieces of, of pottery or pieces of stone and they would write on them. We call them ostraca. So these ostraca were ready available materials that were everywhere. But Ramses is no normal schoolboy. He undoubtedly practices on a much more noble medium papyrus scrolls. When Ramsey was a student, he would sit and he would listen to his masters tell him that he has to copy over and over and over again the words of the wise men of Egypt. And he would copy text like the maxims of Tahotep. Texts like the maxims of Tahotep, they're very old. Tahotep was a vizier from the fifth dynasty. This is in the Old Kingdom. And the ancient Egyptians thought that these words came from the gods themselves to the wise people of Egypt. And then they were written down and over thousands of years became the sort of backbone philosophy of ancient Egypt. Eat. These texts like Tahotep, they say that no man is born wise. Everyone can learn. 
Who men are doing this in a Shahotep would say things like, don't let your wisdom go to your head. Don't become proud. Take counsel from the learned man as well as the ignorant one. I can imagine young Ramses sitting, copying the maxims of Tahotep over and over again, particularly the line, you should do outstanding things so as to be remembered in days to come. And I think he took that to heart. Overall, we look at these texts now and they feel almost familiar. They extol virtues that we still believe in today. Generosity, humbleness, being a considerate person who interacts fairly and lives on the principles of justice. Once Ramses' grandfather became Ramses I, his life changed dramatically. He would have been educated now as a future pharaoh. And of course, the family had a long tradition of military service. Uh, now, a king was expected to be a great charioteer, and so they would have trained Ramses to be a horseman. They would have given Ramses uh, training to lead horses, to care for them, to ride in chariots, and uh, to shoot arrows and other weaponry from the chariot. It's important to understand just how uh, prestigious being a chariot officer was in the Egyptian military. All of the members of the elite of Egyptian society would have wanted to be chariot officers, including, of course, the king. When we look at the battle scenes on the walls of the temple, we always see the king single-handedly driving his chariot, charging into the ranks of his foe, shooting arrows at his hapless enemies. This was something like a medieval knight riding into battle on horseback. And so certainly Ramses would have been trained as a chariot officer from the earliest possible age, certainly in his teens. While the young Ramses learns his future profession, his grandfather and father take stock of the state of the kingdom. Egypt is in a fragile position when the family come to power. In the six decades since the reign of the heretic king, Akhenaten, the kingdom has lost control of the important trade routes that run eastwards along the sea. Some of Egypt's traditional enemies, such as the Hittites, have taken control of territories that have previously been under the control of the pharaoh. This deprives Egypt of substantial resources and income. Ramses I aspires to restore Egypt's former military glory. But he is already very old when he ascends the throne. And even before his work can really begin, he dies in the arms of his son, Seti.